So very good afternoon uh, to our session on cataract and glaucoma preferred practice guidelines. We have with us a cream of expert panel. Dr. Jeevan Tityal should be joining in soon, who leads the cataract cornea and the refractive department at RP Center, New Delhi. Partha Vishwas, our dashing chairperson scientific committee, should be joining. Dr. Soha Saldipurkar, director of Lakshmi Eye Institute, hopefully would join. Dr. Ramanjit Siyota, one of the pioneers in Glockma uh, management of our country from New Delhi, hopefully would join. And we have with us Dr. Shushmita Kaushik to more than compensate for everything, leading the Glockma department at PGI Chandigarh. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to speak about the uh, intraocular uh, intra gonioscopy, the ARCO master. Uh, I thank uh, the AOS panel and Dr. Uh, my engineers, Dr. Uh, what Dr. is Dr. this? Dr. Kavita and Dr. Swati for this opportunity. Some other program. But why so, should that program I come on? I'm so sorry to interrupt in between. Can I quickly know? Uh, Dr. Chitra, you're on mute. Could you please unmute yourself? of what I said? Yeah, what we I can hear you now. Only now. Okay, I said we have a clear... No, no, we heard, we heard everything, Chitra. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was fine, Chitra. Go yeah. ahead, don't worry. Let's okay, start it. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. With all our experts guiding us, let's move on to this interesting session. Co-moderating with me is Dr. Harshul, uh, who's a member ARC Central Zone, and Dr. Satyajit Sina, who's member ARC East. Our first speaker, Dr. Gaurav Lutra, has not yet joined, I think. Yes, I, I don't... he has joined, but he's not joined as panelist, ma'am. Uh, he's messaging, please allow me in. Oh, okay. Then I'm uh, there. I'm I'm there. Uh, he's uh, there. He's there. I'm there. Oh, yes, he's very there. good. Wonderful. <laughs> so, our first speaker is my dear friend, Dr. Gaurav Lutra, who's also the chairman of IRSI, who's been doing wonders over the last year, more so than before. And he is going to talk exactly six minutes, not a minute more, to the different IOL formula, a complex topic which is going to be dealt in six minutes. On to you. Preferred too practice guidelines. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Too much to say and too little time. So I'll try my best and I'll stop wherever the time runs out. Okay? So I'll try to be concise with this. And um, thank you so much for, first of all, inviting me. And it's great to be with friends again. And okay, okay already some time wasted. So we were with the first generation formulas. Um, you know, I think uh, the importance of having the right formula is cannot be uh, emphasized more. We started, of course, long way back with the first generation formulas. And then uh, the we all have heard these names and probably not used many of them. But the uh, second generation formulas, the SRK and uh, the SRK2 is what we used to use. And then uh, the Olsen and the Holiday 1, and then we went on to the Holiday 2. It was a big privilege to have Holiday 2 and Holiday 1 formulas because they were very expensive. So the third generation formulas, including the Hoffer Q for the small eyes, the SRKT, which became much better than the SRK2 formulas and uh, especially for longer eyes, and then the Holiday 1. And then we went on uh, with the Olsen C, uh, which is a ray tracing formula, and then the Hagueis and the Holiday 2. Now, this is where the game changed and our accuracy really improved. And then with the newer formulas, which we currently use, the Barrett's, which is the favorite of almost all of us. And then the Hill RBF, which is the artificial intelligence. And I was part of that formula to a small extent. And the Super Ladders, and then many more as well. So I think there is it's, it's an open game. There's so much available. But this uh, table will summarize a little bit about uh, how we can choose. So in the middle is the normalized. And I'm sure most of us have seen this slide so many times, yet it always impresses me. So the normalized can actually do well with almost all the formulas. As you can see, the virgins formulas on top and then the ray tracing and then the Barrett's 2 and Hill RBF, which we use today. But if you notice here, the Barrett's 2 and the Hill RBF at the bottom will work from the shortest eyes to the longest eyes. So these are not dependent on the interrelationship between the, uh, the axil and the cornea and the AC depth. So they integrate all these things into that. So that's why they work for almost all eyes. Whereas the other formulas which are above will either be good. For example, the Hoffer Q still is amongst the best formulas for the shorter eyes, less than the 21 millimeters. And then the SRKT is still very good for the longer eyes, extremely long eyes. And then for the very, very long eyes, the extreme eyes, the Hagueis is thought to work really well. But these formulas also require the Wong Kok axial uh, adjustment and then they become more reliable. So let's go on and see. The SRKT is what many people would be still using. And when you don't get measurements with your optical biometer, you still want to fall back on the SRKT formula. 
it's a uh, is a theoretical formula and it requires the axial length and the corneal power and using that it predicts the elp and uh, it can be now used mostly for eyes where uh, which are very long eyes if you don't have barrets with you which is available free online so there should be no reason but srkt is still good as i said when you are not able to get optical biometry readings for the axial length and you would want to still use a formula for your immersion scans and i still use it for those cases the hopper q uh, as i just told you was uh, re is relies on a personalized acons ac depth axial length and corneal curvatures and this is extremely uh, good for short eyes so in pediatric uh, cataracts and for eyes with smaller than 22 millimeters of axial length i think hopper q still has a place the holiday 2 was a very popular formula was uh, is not used much now but it was could work from the shortest to the longer eyes i will not delve because uh, it required the pre operative refraction data which was optional but required if you wanted accuracy and also depended on white to white measurements which are not accurate on most of the devices that we use so had limited uh, use today the olsen c uh is has carries a c constant and again it is beyond the scope of my talk to go into the details but it's a ray tracing formula and uh, has been good in some people's hands has did not work extremely well in my hands uh, i worked a lot with the hill rbf uh, with dr warren hill uh, giving data from india for uh, setting up the hill rbf one it's an artificial intelligence based formula and uh, it again has developed to the hill rbf 3 which has come a long way now with a huge range of eyes that can be checked with it it does not depend on the elp it's actually not even a formula it just uses thousands of eyes data of uh, various uh, parameters uh, which are uh, taken into it so uh, and using that it kind of tells you uh, whether your eye will uh, have a within bounds uh, you know uh, outcome or not so this is one of the best features of this formula that if it is able to predict a good a good il par it will do that and it will say that it's in bounds if it is not because if it does not have enough eyes in the artificial intelligence database to say that this eye you can predict well then it will just mark it as out of bounds it will still give you a par but it will mark out of bounds so that means that if you use this you are likely to have results which may be compromised so you can be careful and there are a lot of other uh, new improvements happening with the hill rbf in 2018 we got the rbf2 with a much larger database and works from minus 5 diopters to the 40 diopters eyes and almost 12000 plus eyes uh, also with almost 1000 eyes with short axial lens and now we've recently launched the hill rbf3 as well so going ahead the barrets is what i think is the favorite of most people today and people would like to know about it now hawaii barrets became so nice is because the posterior corneal surface was included in the barrets suit suit and it includes basically three formulas and then further variations of that the barrets universal 2 the tor the barrets toric and the true k going on i think uh, it's a virgins based formula and the minimum requirements are the ac depth and the axial length and the keratometry and then it requires a lens factor and uh, an a constant and uh, it can be used for almost all kinds of eyes from the shortest to the normal to the long eyes and what are on the left is those things which are necessary on the right are those which are optional and if you use the design factor and the ac depth and the white to white and lens thickness you will get much better Uh, outcome so uh, wherever possible these should be used and all the optical biometers will give you all these things so that makes it much much better if you use it with optical biometry again uh, going on to details of design factor is not necessary here barrett toric has changed the game completely so i think anybody who's doing toric should be using the barrett toric calculator which is also part of most of the company nomograms i like to use the barrett stroop k formula a lot for post laser vision correction eyes and it is also integrated into most of the optical biometers but for those who do not have access to this or the other formulas the ascaris calculator for post refractive eyes is wonderful a new thing which came up on the il master 700 was the barrett's uh, total keratometry formulas which basically measure the posterior corneal curvature and use the actual uh, curvature to you know use with these two formulas Uh, the barrett's tk universal 2 and the barrett's tk toric again beyond the scope to go into details can the barrett's be used with ultrasonic biometry not really because um, it is not meant for that but if you would like to use it it is possible to do that using immersion biometry using the ulip database and there is a small if you read the bottom of this slide there is a excel sheet available on the ulip website where you can actually create a nomogram for using the barrett's universal 2 with the Uh, immersion ultrasound these are the variables required for the various formulas if you see that the barrett's obviously requires all these things including the refraction the hill rbf requires all of them but no refraction and the older formulas require fewer things so the more the number of variables chances are that you are going to get better outcomes there are other newer formulas like the super larders and uh, this is uh, again available on ilcalc.com uh, developed by udit devgan and supposed to be a really um, in interesting formula and it again is constantly updating like the hill rbf because it takes uh, data from all over the world and tries to bring about you know it uh, puts them into three dimensions 
And then there is the Kane formula again, which is becoming very popular. And I will not go into the details, the Evo formula by my friend Fan Hamburg. So there's lots of stuff happening. These are all top end formulas now today, which are really looking like they're going to, you know, they're competing with Barrett's and some studies show them to be slightly better than Barrett's other than not. And many of them are freely available on the internet. So this is how it settles down. Finally, as I showed you before, that these are the latest formulas, which are, you know, requiring no little or no adjustment. I think, ma'am, do I have one minute more to finish? So the shorter eyes, uh, we will axial length less than 21 millimeters. Uh, uh, we will have uh, either one of these situations, either post-refractive surgery or serious elevation of the retina or microphthalmos or nanophthalmos. So we have to watch out for those. And there we can use the Hoffer Q and the Holiday 2 formulas or one of the Barrett's and the Hill RBF formulas. So going on to the longer eyes, uh, is my time up or do I have 30 seconds more to go? 30 seconds, yeah. Okay. So the Hill yeah, RBF... Uh, uh, Yes. What? Yes. Because I heard only one buzz, so I'm not sure, and I don't see a timer, so I'm not aware. Anyway, I'll just finish in two, three slides. Uh, Doctor Garab, your time is already up. I would request you to please sum it up. In okay, I'll go to my last slide. Uh, because right. we uh, also sure. have a part. Sure, sure. sure. I'll okay. go to the la last slide. Thank you. So you know, the first buzz did not come, but I'll just come to the last slide, which is right here. Okay. So to summarize. The SRKT formula is recommended for the rather long eyes, whereas the Hoffer Q is recommended for the rather short eyes. The Holiday 1 and Hoffer Q formulas are equally good for eyes with the axial length between 21 and 21.49 millimeters. The Holiday 1 formula seems to perform better than the Hoffer Q for eyes between 23.5 and 25.99. And the fourth generation formulas like the Hill RBF3, Barrett, Hages, or the Holiday 2 should provide the highest accuracy. I hope I was able to make a little bit of sense in the six minutes. Thank you so much, ma'am, for inviting me to speak. And I'll stop sharing. Essentially, what I want to ask you is, if it is an eye with an extreme of axial length, what would be your second choice of formula? I believe Barrett's will be your first. What would yes. be your second choice? Just a one word. I, I use both Barrett's and Hill on all my printouts, and then I like to compare them. But short eyes, Hoffer Q, long eyes, SRK to call back on. You still do that? Okay. SRKT, if it's an opaque media, sometimes you have those eyes with, uh, but I typically don't have SRKT on my printouts. It's Barrett's yes, post, and. Uh, post RKI. Post RK, I would use the Ascaris calculator, ma'am, because I really trust the Ascaris calculator. But those who have Almaster 700, they might want to use the Barrett's TK and uh, you know use that. So I think you would have more experience with that than yes, me. Yes, you could more. It's the main thing with the post RK is you need to get as close to the center uh, when you're doing your uh, measurements. And uh, IUL Master 700 has smaller rings and or the Atlas topographer would be good, but going back to ACRS calculator also seems to do pretty I, well. Yes, ma'am. I use the Pentacam for the EKR report and using that, I try to see whether the central corneas, uh, you know, curvatures, and that becomes really useful for post RKIs if you want to feed in the right keratometry in the Ascaris calculator. True net. Yeah, yeah. True. Okay. So one last thing. So much is said about total keratometry. Is it really critical in a normal eye? Not at all. In fact, some of the new studies have shown that, including Dr. Barrett's, that you know, for standard eyes, there may not be any advantage over using TK, but only for post-refractive eyes, there may be an advantage. Otherwise, the Barrett's can nomogram works really well. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. Stay with us. We would look forward sure, to your Thanks. Great Thank talk. Our next speaker is Dr. Mohan Rajan, who is the chairman of Rajan Eye Care Center at Chennai. And he is going to be talking on managing posterior capsular rent, and your time starts now. Able to see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see your screen, Doctor. Please go ahead. Sorry. Something went wrong. Can we take Harshul and you come back? Yeah, yeah. I'll come yeah. Back. Sorry, sorry, Sitra. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, our next speaker is Doctor Harshul. Is going to tell us something different. The need of a capsular tension ring in eyes with pseudo exfoliation. On to you, Dr. Uh, thank you so much, Chitra, ma'am. And uh, so I'm speaking on the need of uh, capsular tension ring and other capsular tension devices in cases of pseudo exfoliation. Can you see my screen? Yes, Can yes. You hear me, yeah. Okay. Good. No, we please. all know that. Yeah, so we all know that pseudo exfoliation syndrome. It's an age-related disorder of the extracellular matrix. Uh, just a minute. Sir. Oh, 
okay and there is pathologic progressive accumulation and gradual deposition of gray and white fibrillar material on various ocular structures like lens capsule pupillary border ciliary body zonules tubercular meshwork and endothelium so this is how the typical pseudo exfoliation uh, uh, in the eye looks like so we need to dilate the pupil and see because many times we may miss the pseudo exfoliation uh, which is there in the eyes and this is the classic three ring sign which is seen uh, in a case of pseudo exfoliation there is a uh, the fibrillary material on the pupillary border followed by a clear zone which is because of the rubbing of the back of the iris surface on the lens capsule and again there is a uh, fibrillary material deposit which is seen so why pseudo exfoliation affects the uh, cataract surgery because uh, there may be intraoperative and post operative complication because of that it basically weakens capsule and zonular apparatus secondary to progressive proteolytic disintegration of the suspensory ligament of the lens and most importantly degree of pseudo exfoliation material visible in the eye it does not seem to correlate with the degree of zonular weakness so these are the various capsular tension devices which may be required in the cases of pseudo exfoliation ranging from the uh, simple ctr ring capsular tension ring which is a horseshoe shaped ring uh, made of pmma with which has two eyelets and there is one henderson ctr ring which you can see it has undulations it facilitates the easier cortical matter removal or we may need modified ctr ring or sione ring or or we may require capsular tension segment if we don't want to use this sione ring so these ctr rings were first described by hara et al in 1991 and it works by creating tension within the capsular bed to support an area of zonular weakness via recruitment of surrounding intact zonular fibers so how do we plan surgically the, these cases if we have a non dilating pupil uh, we may need to use iris hooks or rings in these cases if we have a mild zonular weakness or if the dialysis is less than 4 clock hours ctr ring alone can suffice in those cases but if there is moderate to severe zonular weakness or there is greater than 4 clock hours of dialysis ctr alone will not suffice we need sione ctr to fix the CTR with the sclera or we need CTR along with capsular tension segment and along with them uh, we may require capsular hook to provide stability to capsular back during surgery. Timing of CTR placement is very crucial. So the dictum is uh, we should use CTR as late as possible but as early as needed. So in mild cases of uh, pseudo exfoliation or mild cases of zonal laxity we may we mostly use the CTR after doing phaco and cortical removal but in severe cases we use them after capsular excess. So there may be some complication which may occur while implanting the CTR ring. There may be accidental anterior capsule tear or posterior capsule rupture and dislocation of CTR and in fact if we have any of these conditions CTR should not be used. So this is the Henderson CTR as I said it has eight equally spaced indentations so only uh, advantage over the standard CTR is that it allows easier removal of the cortical matter. So CTR ring it comes in three sizes. So in the typical normalized we use the 12 by 10. That's the uncompressed and compressed diameter of the ring. For highly myopic eye we use the 14, uh, 12 millimeter size of the ring. Uh, if you look at the capsular tension segment, it is uh, made of the again PMMA, but it has a, an eyelet and a hook which is protruding in the center and it, it, it lies above the anterior capsule so that we can use it temporarily or for a permanent fixation. Another advantage of capsular tension segment is that we can use these devices if we have an anterior capsule tear or a posterior capsule tear and we may use one or two capsular tension segment depending on the need. So let's uh, go to the videos. Just So here the, the, there are various ways we can implant this uh, CTR ring. This is the uh, implantation using this injector. So we thread this we, we, we thread this ring in the injector and the leading eyelid this is the case in which the uh, malignant ring was also used to dilate the pupil. So once the leading eyelid goes in we keep on pushing the ring and we use the second 
instrument like Cubelens Hook or any dialect kind of instrument to release the trailing eyelet. So once it goes in the capsule bag, it stabilizes the capsule bag. This is a free end technique of implanting the CTR ring. We go from the side port incision and we use again the Cubelens Hook to just guide this ring and once it goes inside it stabilizes so this is the case which has more than four clock hour of zonal laxity so we use capsular hook first to stabilize the capsular bag which gives the anterior posterior stability and once you have stabilized it you do FACO take off the all the nuclear and cortical matter and put the CTR ring in and once CTR ring provides stability here I'm using a capsular tension segment with 90 proline. You may also use Gore-Tex suture. So once this segment is put and it's tied to the sclera, it provides a good centration and long-term stability to the capsular bag. So I think if we have a planned approach using various capsular tension devices in these cases, it can give satisfactory results in short and long term. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Dr. Haripriya, I see you are there. I have a question for you. Can you unmute Dr. Haripriya? Yes. Okay. Now, if there is a more significant sooner exfoliation, would you actually consider keeping the haptic in the sulcus and the optic in the bag kind of a situation? Do you feel that there is a role for that? Uh, absolutely. So I think that is a good uh, 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 placement to have the IOL placed. In the sulcus, you, 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 you do your FACO, place the CTR, yes. but place the IOL in the sulcus and capture the optic in the rexus. So I find that that actually gives the uh, IOL good stability long term as well. Again, if you've had a toric IOL which has rotated in one eye of a myo, would you actually, theoretically, we know that equatorial friction is less in a large capsule bag. Would you think of placing a CTR in the other eye? Honest answer. Um, I would, but I'm not sure if it really helps too much, just placing a CTR. In spite of it, you still may have a, the same issue with IOL rotation. Okay, I want a question to you and uh, Gaurav again, or even Harshul. Do you think that it's the present day small rexes and the pseudo exfoliation, which actually could be causing the anterior lens capsular contracture and progressive capsular weakness? Because those days when there were those scan opener, uh, opener capsular to me, which was done, I don't remember uh, seeing so many subluxations of the IOL into the vitreous or dislocation of the IOL bag complex. Could it be that creating a small rexus does greater contracture? Your thoughts? Uh, definitely. So I think once you have a smaller rexus, the chance of contraction is much higher. So even if you're making a small rexus, I would suggest at least making a nick at the end of the surgery. So then you kind of relax the contraction process and this will help preventing contracture. If not, do a YAG in the early post-operative period. Uh, Harshul, yes? Yeah, yeah. So I always believe in uh, for making a perfect capsule access. Even if it's small in the beginning, once you put your uh, CTR ring, once you implanted the IOL, you can go and enlarge the rexis by giving neck with the micro scissors and have an adequate size capsule rexis, which is very less prone for capsular phimosis. And earliest you see the case, it starts contracting, you can use the laser, YAG laser to give, as ma'am said, you can give the relaxing incision so that the further subluxation or the, of the IOL back complex won't happen. So I think we still continue at the end of the talk with a lack of clarity whether CTR placement in a young pseudo exfoliative eye actually makes sense, especially in Torix and premium IOL. It is something which we would take a decision on a case to case basis. I, I hope do do hope my panelists agree on that, Dr. Hari Priya. Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. Why not do reverse optic capture for the other eye patients with high myopia? So I would be coming back to you on that, uh, Dr. Mohan, on that yeah. particular point. I'll be discussing with you. Our next speaker is Dr. Mohan Rajan Harshul. That was a nice talk. Thank you. Uh, and he is going to take us on to managing posterior capsular rent. Your yep. your take home points for a PCR management. This is a preferred practice guidelines. I want crisp slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chitra. Thank you, Chitra. Within the next six minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, the posterior capsule rent. As you know, when you have a posterior capsule rent, if you use coaxial irrigation aspiration, that is going to make the matters worse because it's going to enlarge the tire and more and more vitreous start, start coming into the anterior chamber. 
and this is going to make a, it's like a tsunami. So always use a bimanual irrigation. It's very important. If you have a small PC tire, then convert that into a PC posterior capsular excess. This is very, very important because you can go ahead with the, uh, the, the posterior capsular excess are always very, very strong and you can go ahead with the lens implantation in the back as well. So again, very important again, when you have a PC tire, do not pull out. If you pull out of this, I think what happens is a well, small PC tear becomes a huge PC tear, and you can see the nucleus also going inside the, into the into the vitreous cavity, and the vitreous starts coming into the entry chamber. And what is a small tear initially becomes a very, very, very huge tear. What do you do when you have a PC tear? Always inject viscoat. I don't have any financial into the viscoat. See what is happening. When you do a when you inject a viscoat there, you can see the small PC tear. That viscoat goes and tamponates the break, and then once you stabilize the anterior chamber, slowly withdraw the fecal trip and then go in for a bimanual. Once you have a PC tear, switch over from the coaxial to the bimanual, that is create a right side port. And that is what I want to tell. Again, you can see here I'm trying to go after the nucleus. The, Posterior polar cataract, you can see what is happening. Uh, there is a PC tear, a sudden deepening of the anterior and posterior chamber. I am injecting viscoat there and coming out, immediately creating a right side port, put tricot there. Identify the presence or absence of vitreous in the anterior chamber. Remove the vitreous first. Use always a biomanual automated vitrectomy. No, do, don't use a D-Vickers or a, don't, don't use, uh, use a sponge or something like that. Always remove the vitreous first and then remove the cortex as well. So this is again very, very important. You can say anterior vitrectomy through the pass plana is also very, very important. Nowadays, uh, the pass plana route is also, um, uh, as advocated by uh, Abhay Vaswada, the pass plana route is uh, supposed to be very easy. You can see this particular patient had a vitreous in the anterior. This vitreous is floating in the anterior chamber. There's a blob of the vitreous in the anterior chamber. There's an eye in in pushing as well. And you can see that uh, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to go in and try to remove the vitreous by, by having an anterior chamber maintainer. But more importantly, I am removing the vitreous in the anterior chamber, but I want to remove the vitreous more effectively from behind. So always create a pass planar entry. I'm trying to remove the vitreous from the anterior chamber. And then, then I put a trocar and cannula and go inside into the vitreous cavity. This is an anterior chamber. You can see and removing vitreous from the anterior chamber. Now, once I do that, you can see the vitreous is still there, presence in the vitreous. So you can't remove the vitreous from the limbal root totally. That is important. So you need to go behind and remove the vitreous because you can remove less amount of vitreous, less traction on the vitreous base as well. You can see here, once I put a trocar and cannula, and you can see how beautifully this vitreous, which is there in the anterior chamber, comes off. And that is, again, a very, very important message. And uh, the trocar and cannula is not very easy, uh, not uh, very difficult to put. And uh, just measure 3.5 millimeters from the limbus. If you cannot, you don't have a trocar and cannula, you can always put a sclerotomy uh, with the 20 gauge needle as well. Again, and as you can see, this is a particular patient. I'm doing, a, I'm putting preservative free tricot diluted there and putting a trocar and cannula into the posterior chain into the, into the vitreous cavity and removing the vitreous from behind and keeping an anterior chamber maintainer there and then removing the vitreous from behind, which makes life very, very easy for all of us. Once you do that, you can see that once you remove the vitreous and then the cortex as well, always I told you, remove the vitreous and then remove the cortex, always use bimanual techniques and inject viscoat or a visilon or a hyalon or whatever it is. When you come out of the eye, stabilize the anti-chamber. This is a very small PC tear you can see here. I'm trying to put a single piece, agri-soft lenses into the, into the bag because I know it is a small PC tear, it will not extend and the patient is doing very well after that. So once you have a larger PC tear, you can see here, uh, I'm trying to put a do, do, do an optic capture. Again, this optic capture, you can see here, uh, this is a large PC tear in the posterior polar cataract, very typically two pillars of the, uh, on the posterior capsule. Uh, uh, the optic capture is done by the, the, the haptic is placed in the sulcus and the, uh, the optic is captured into the capsular excess margin. The end point is the ovalization of the, uh, of the uh, uh, of the of, of the capsular excess margin, which is again very very important for you to understand. This lens will be stable. This will not move a micron. There is no possibility of a UGH syndrome. You can see this two months, six months, two years. Then how how st stable these lenses are. The take home message: PPP in PCR or the preferred preferred uh, practice patterns in PCR is small PCR converted into a posterior capsular excess. Do not pull out. Stabilize the anterior chamber. 
by injecting this coat you strike out preservative free once you pull out of the eye and once you come out of the eye make sure that you remove the vitreous first by using a bimanual automated anterior vitrectomy either a limbal or a pasplana whatever you are comfortable with remove the vitreous first and then remove the cortex and the epineucleus and then appropriate eye oil depending on whatever the capsule is there whether the posterior capsule is there or rim of the anterior capsule is there if you have the rim of the anterior capsule that is intact then you can do an optic capture i always prefer to suture the wounds when you have vitreous loss because the incidence of post operative endothelial medicine leaking wounds is so very very high in these patients thank you very much for the wonderful opportunity sir thank you very much dr mohan rajan they were very crisp take home points and that was exactly the essence of this uh, whole session yeah. was So, Hari Priya, I have to ask you a question, and Mohan, you stay glued on. When would yes, you yes. think of doing a posterior optic capture as one other solution for preferred practice guidelines with a PCR, Dr. Hari Priya? Uh, just to have the good IOL support, then I would do a posterior optic capture. Yeah. I just also wanted to add that it's great if one can do a pass plana vitrectomy because that the only aspect that it needs additional skills. so i think i also feel that an anti vitrectomy done well may also work uh, quite well in most people's hands uh, only to ensure that there's no traction on the vitreous base when it's being done uh, mohan when would you do a reverse optic capture when there is a pcr when you when i have a toric lens okay when i have a pcr i put a toric lens then i reverse put a reverse optic capture the reverse optic capture is the other way around the haptic is in the back the optic is uh, is in front that is the reverse optic capture so that's what i would do in a patient you are asking about the previous case where in the high myopia and the, 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 the toric lens is moving i would put up a ctr but i would do a reverse optic capture in this patient i so, i beg to differ on that i would want to know from hari priya to i would uh, uh, do an optic reverse optic capture if there is a little larger pcr in the capsular bag where i know i can leave the haptic but i'm not happy about leaving the optic in the bag is when i would bring it forward and do an optic capture hari priya any difference in thought uh, i also i also find it difficult to do a reverse optic capture like a small rex single piece lens because it yeah. doesn't stay with a three piece it stays yeah. most of the toric lens comes on a single piece platform yeah. it normally goes back when we form the ac so i think i don't know is it a specific lens you would use for that sir or uh... no i use the iq toric lenses only what i have done Okay. and uh, it's not difficult at all the reverse optic capture I is not difficult at all because already optic. the lens is in the bag and you just have to pull the optic up a little that's all okay and uh, so the reverse optic capture is uh, uh, is not difficult at all but of course the with the single piece i mean the multi piece lens is much easier and of course in pseudo exfoliation all the pseudo exfoliations i don't put the lens nowadays in the bag i always put it in the in the sulcus the multi piece lenses and then optic capture i did I do now. So, uh, because this uh, David Chang has shown in this study, study as well, the long-term stability of the lenses, the pseudo-fake donuses, everything is much better when you capture the lenses. Uh, Dr. Jagdish Reddy, could you share your screen? Uh, Gaurav, you have anything to add here? If there is a large, uh, unmute yourself. If there's a large, if there's a PCR, what would you do if you have a planned toric IOL in this patient? So that's always uh, going to be tough if it's. Uh, are you asking me, ma'am? I, I hope yes, it's me. Yes, asking you. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So I would, you know, if it's it's a small rent, I will obviously want to convert it into a primary. I mean, into a capsular rexus. Some so many times I'm actually able to do it, and it's best to act on it like immediately because you can actually prevent vitreous from coming forward. Make sure that you know you can keep the vitreous behind and manage the PC rent. And so many times you can actually put the toric in the back if the vitreous is managed correctly. But if it's a big rent and the stability of the IL is not. Uh, possible then i would sometimes either abort it or as you said you know you could actually put the haptics behind and do and capture but the capturing a single piece lens is very unpredictable very, yes, so sometimes yes. it just doesn't work you know exactly so. i wanted that message across thank you gaurav our next speaker is dr jagdish reddy heading the cataract department at lvpr hyderabad and he's going to give us a crisp talk on incorporating posterior corneal par in our iol par calculations on to you dr jagdish we want to see you too yeah very good to see Yes, on to you. You unmute yourself, yeah. Yeah, I've unmuted. Yeah, very good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra, for having me here. And hopefully, the word crisps the crisp doesn't scare me here. So I'll try to cover in the next few minutes. So I'll be talking to you, uh, 
you all on incorporating posterior corneal power in the IOL power calculation. So I'll be taking you through understanding the posterior corneal astigmatism. How do we measure it? And calculation of IOL power using the posterior corneal astigmatism. And do we really need to measure or uh, predictable uh, ones are uh, preferable now and the current outcomes. So earlier, like when you look at the total corneal power or astigmatism, it's the sum of anterior and posterior corneal curvature or the power uh, in these two surfaces. Earlier, it was calculated assuming that the uh, anterior curvature and posterior curvature ratio was fixed. So, but this is not uh, true. And nowadays we directly measure it or we do have predictions available for IOL power calculations. So this was one of the earlier studies that has worked on posterior corneal astigmatism by Douglas Koch. And he has shown that there is certain amount of astigmatism at the back surface of the cornea. And he did put a magnitude to us from a study about 0.3 diopters. On the right of his screen, if you see majority, majority of the astigmatism is less than 0.5 diopters at the back surface, whereas the anterior curvature can have any amount of astigmatism. And if you look at the pattern of orientation, the posterior corneal astigmatism is oriented in the majority of the times vertically, as you see here uh, in this scatter plot. And if you look at this bar graph on your left, you have the uh, anterior corneal curvature orientation at different age groups. On your right, you have your posterior corneal curvature orientation. If you look, there's a stark difference here in majority of the individuals in the, uh, in the posterior corneal uh, surface, you have the astigmatism oriented vertically, and this is not true in case of anterior corneal curvature. And if you look at this uh, table, like the, it is a comparison between anterior cornea and posterior cornea. If you look at the posterior cornea onto your right, the magnitude doesn't change too much. Um, and the orientation is also pretty oriented vertically all through a different age groups. Whereas there's a lot of variability in the anterior corneal uh, surface. So with this study, it was clear that the posterior steepest meridian is always uh, almost vertically aligned. This alignment generates against the rule astigmatism, which compensates anteriorly uh, with the rule astigmatism and increases anterior against the rule astigmatism. PCA on average reduces the total corneal astigmatism by about 13.4%. And in about 28.8% of individuals, the total corneal astigmatism differed from the anterior corneal astigmatism only by greater than 0.5 diopters or about 10 degrees of orientation. So in a nutshell, if you select an uh, uh, intraocular lens uh, using only anterior corneal curvature measurements, you could be overcorrect, you would be leading, it will lead to overcorrection in eyes that have with the rule astigmatism and undercorrection of the eyes that have against the rule astigmatism. So the devices that are available for measurements, the IOL mass is 700 and the shim flag images, uh, imaging systems like the Pentacam, uh, Galilee, CDS and the optical coherence tomogram, tomography. And if you look at how these uh, measurements uh, compare among devices, this is a recent study that is compared between IOL Master 700 and Pentacam. Here they do uh, share that they're repeatable measurements, but when you want to interchange these devices, it may not be a good option. And recently we did publish a paper comparing IOL Master 700 and Galilee in the same topic. So here we did see that total corneal power from the Galilee differed significantly from uh, TK values from the IOL Master 700. And we also suggested that the measurements from these cannot be used interchangeably. So coming to the calculation methods, the different calculation methods that are available and a few are as nomograms, a few are available online. I'll not be talking to you all about all these, but I'll be just taking you through Barrett Toric IOL calculator uh, from the APACRS website. Once you go to the website, once you select the IOL power calculation for the Toric lenses, uh, you'll, you'll get to this page. Once you fill all the values in that page, you'll be asked whether you want to use a predictive uh, posterior corneal astigmatism or measured posterior corneal astigmatism. It's default predicted in all the cases. So, but if you want to change, you can always change if you have posterior corneal astigmatism measured. So once you click on the uh, measured PCA and it takes you to a different page wherein it will ask you which device you've measured your posterior corneal astigmatism, you select that device and enter your posterior corneal astigmatism values here 
uh, curvature values here. And then it gives you the amount of posterior corneal astigmatism here. And then an IOL power is calculated along with an orientation of the IOL. And it does depict whether you've selected a measured PCA or a predicted PCA. So are we sure that we want to select a measured or are we comfortable with a predicted uh, results that we get as of today? So this is a wonderful study that just came out this month from American Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, it has been studied in 79 patients where they looked at uh, uh, how the baritoric IOL calculator compares with predicted versus calculated. And also they compared with the most recent formula, that's the Keynes formula. Here, if you look at uh, overall outcome, the mean absolute prediction error, mean median absolute prediction error uh, were comparable with among all the groups. And if you look at, look at the percentage of eyes which were within plus or minus 0.5 diopters, they were comparable in all the groups. And if you look at with the rule astigmatism, the trend was pretty similar what we saw uh, with uh, the uh, earlier slide. And the similar trend was seen even with against the rule astigmatism. So there is no variation uh, with the rule or against the rule when you are using a predicted or a measured uh, posterior corneal astigmatism. And in a nutshell, if you look at the outcomes in this study, so number of uh, the percentage of patients who achieved uh, a half a diopter or less uh, postoperatively, I think they were comparable uh, in all the groups, whether it was a measured PCA or a predicted uh, PCA. And this is one of the ongoing studies uh, at LVPI. So for this presentation, I thought we'll just pulled out uh, the data and we analyzed it. So here we were comparing Barrett's uh, predicted PCA with uh, Barrett formula with measured PCA among different devices. And we did see they were pretty comparable uh, so far. And we are still recruiting patients. And probably we'll be able to show if there's any difference uh, to everybody later. And in a nutshell, if you look at, uh, we do agree at this point of time that posterior corneal uh, astigmatism has an effect on the overall outcomes of toric IOLs. I think your threshold should be lower for toric IOL implantation in patients with against the rule astigmatism. So there's variability among devices that measure the uh, posterior corneal astigmatism. And these values cannot be among, from the devices cannot be uh, interchanged at this point of time. And we need more data. Uh, if in case we want to use these uh, devices uh, from one across to the other. So recent results showed uh, comparable outcomes with both predicted and measured PCA. So I would power calculation using online baritoric I will calculate it with a selection of predicted PCA appears to be a very reliable method. And that's my preferred choice as well. Oh, that was a wonderful talk. Actually, it Thank took care you. of many of the very good talk. It covered it all. But still, I would like to ask you something more for the sake of the audience. What do you feel would be the role? Why? What is the role of uh, posterior corneal power measurement? Is it as relevant in normal eyes as it is in post-classic eyes? Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Chitra. I think uh, as we see, uh, it normalizes also it plays a role. And it has shown that less, that less amount of astigmatism on the anterior corneal surface may have lesser role. But I think as the amount of astigmatism increases, that it does play a big role. So I think it has to be taken into consideration when you are planning a toric IOL implantation uh, in patients, uh, even in uh, virgin corneas. So you do say that a mathematically derived calculation of a posterior corneal astigmatism would fare nearly as well as the uh, total K of an IOL mass of 700 based on your analysis studies? Yeah, at this point of time uh, of the literature that has been published and what we saw in our experience, I think uh, we are more comfortable in doing the predicted uh, PCA because the measurements, the way there is variability in the measurements from devices uh, in, in the posterior corneal astigmatism. So even a slight variation in the measurements can affect the outcome. It may not be the calculation system, but the value that we get uh, can lead to an error. So at this point of time, uh, to be on a safer side, I would err towards a predicted uh, PCA rather than a measurable PCA. Now, we know with a Schlemfunk device, we can measure the posterior corneal part. How different would this be from the uh, swept source OCT? Your thoughts? Okay, so there, uh, there is only, I think, a couple of papers that, that have looked at these. 
uh, values and de definitely there's uh, there they do well on their own but when you're comparing there's definitely a difference between these two and we cannot compare these two uh, directly and i think they have to it depends on your own expertise if you're using one device you know how much to manipulate and uh, change your values uh, in order to get a better outcome thank you very much that gave us a lot of information i'm sure we know we are in the right direction uh, you stay on with us uh, you all need not move out with the glaucoma there is a lot of cataract in that too so we go on to our first oh we have anaga yet sorry our next speaker is dr anaga harur who is a member arc west who is going to be talking on something very relevant anaga could you share yes ma'am or when to avoid multifocal in modern day अपॉर्चुनिटी टू स्पीक यूर एंड आई वुड बी स्पीकिंग ऑन वेन नॉट टू इम्प्लांट अ मल्टीफोकल आई ओ एल so clear accommodative vision is the holy grail that all of us as ophthalmologists want to give to our patients and today we want to give them not just far and near vision but also intermediate vision so that the patient can do all his activities without being dependent on glasses now compared to monofocal iols we all know that multifocal iols would give us greater satisfaction to our patients but it also include involves greater effort and let's see how we can bring that effort for the benefit of the patient now why do all of us fear multifocal iols even though it could be ranging from 10 to 20 or 30% of our practice depending on our different practices it's not just the cost but it is the fear of a dissatisfied patient it is the fear that the patient might end up having lot of glare and halos and we might end up doing an iol exchange now and hence the challenges in multifocal iols is not only in the right patient selection the right iol selection counseling of the patient precise biometry and surgery and then finally if after all this if the patient is still dissatisfied to know why he is and how do we manage him so the challenges would be first is in the preoperative and second in the intraoperative phases let's see when not to implant a multifocal iol what i feel personally is when we are using a multifocal iol it should be a functionally optimum iol for that patient so we need to communicate with him regarding what are his visual expectations what are his lifestyle choices his personality what is his work and what are the leisure activities that he does so it's best to avoid those who are unrealistic who are a cynical who are suspicious patients patient who may be very finicky hypercritical demanding patients now we all know that multifocal iols especially the diffractive ones would have almost 18% of scatter and hence there would be some amount of glare and halos associated with these rings so if a patient is doing very regular night driving i would definitely avoid a patient with a for, for him a multifocal iol again though there are those patients who do a lot of work in dim light again we do not know whether the contrast sensitivity would be good enough or if the light to near and intermediate vision could be good enough for them and hence it's best to at least apprise them of the situation or best to avoid them now in the clinical preoperative workup it's extremely important to get a perfect biometry and hence do a repeat reading and ensure that the readings are done before any dilatation or anesthetic drops or any kind of aplanation is done also check the ocular surface and rule out any mgd treat it uh, if it is present look at the topography oct macula and the pupillimetry also now this is a patient who has an mgd and look at the corneal staining so these are patients who would have a biometry error the keratometric reading would be in variable and erroneous and hence in all these patients who have dry eye they could be diabetics or just senile and or patients who have used anti glaucoma medications for a long time a corneal uh, surface measure uh, assessment is very important patients of mgd have to be checked and uh, pre treated especially when you are using premium iols also for torix and for multifocal iols now if the patient has an astigmatism ensure that it is symmetrical if it is an asymmetric irregular astigmatism and or if it's a keratoconus best to avoid 
Again, if it's a previous refractive surgery, we know that multifocal eye implant in the multifocal cornea could give rise to an unpredictable outcome. There are raised higher order aberrations like spherical aberration, coma. There could be reduced contrast and hitting emetropia could be difficult. K-metry may not be accurate. Like for example, in this space, post-LASIK patient, you can see the amount of greater uh, um, keratometric variability in this EKR graph and hence it's best to avoid these patients. Very important to do a very good slit lamp examination under high magnification so that you pick up very faint corneal opacities like um, uh, EBMD or any other smaller opacities or irregularities. Uh, OCT macula, we always do in our patients to rule out macular pathologies. Uh, in diabetics, if it's a, a diabetic for just a few years with absolutely no diabetic retinopathy, you could still counsel, control, and use multifocal IOLs with caution. But explaining the patient uh, uh, the need for regular uh, retinal monitoring. However, if the patient has been a chronic diabetic, long-standing or uncontrolled even for a short period, it's best, especially if the retina is showing changes at the macula, best to avoid. Glaucoma, we know definitely best to avoid because there could be field defects, reduced contrast sensitivity already. In congenital cataracts, <laughs> CO rate, changing parameters, fluctuating biometry, reduced contrast sensitivity, best to avoid. Chromatic cataracts can cause tilt in the lens and hence best to avoid. In large angle strabismus and amblyopia, you could have a patient with unilateral young patient, a secondary complicated cataract, secondary to repeated iridocyclitis. This is best to avoid. This was a patient who came to us with multifocal in one eye, but as you can see here, there was no multifocality at all. So best to avoid in the other eye. Remember a large angle kappa or large angle alpha can increase dysphotopsia in the patients. Uh, this can be done by using either an IOL master or an eye tracy. Then intraoperatively, <laughs> have perfect incision and perfect surgery. If there's a zonular dialysis, it could give, give rise to decentration or tilt, asymmetric CCC, zonular weakness. Or if there's a large PC tear, it's best to avoid because it could cause decentration or tilt. So it's always very difficult to choose an ideal multifocal IOL patient. So what you choose for your patient, even in a multifocal, could be very uh, dicey. So you could prefer adopts or trifocals if the intermediate vision is more important. Moderate hyperopes are usually the happiest. Uh, mild myopes, you have to be uh, very cautious. If it's monofocal in the first eye, just uh, be careful, most uh, best to avoid multifocal in the other eye, or you can use eye hands, which is a very good option. Size may matter, very large pupils, very small pupils could uh, be a red flags. Small pupils, if you're using iris hooks, for example, can distort the pupil. And uh, most importantly, counsel the patient that he might still need to use glasses for activities and that they would require neuroadaptation, best to underpromise and overdeliver. So uh, promising newer technologies of newer advances in multifocal IOLs could be the correct choice and give us happier patients. But if the uh, wrong lens is selected for the patient, then he could make life hell for you. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Anaka. You showed all the issues and covered it extremely well. I have a question for you, Hari Priya, so that you don't go off to sleep with us here. Now that we have a multifocals with a larger central uh, optic zone, do you think we need to be so overly concerned about angle alphas now? Hari Priya, are you there? Yes, I, I am here. Uh, yeah, they are a little, they're a little more forgiving today, but yeah. I think it's also a combination of factors. If everything else is perfect, and the patient doesn't mind the example is not driving at night is not a driver by profession if everything else is fine then i would consider going being a little bit more uh, aggressive with the angle alpha but if the patient has any erm or anything else then i would definitely say no so i think it depends on a patient to patient basis can i answer the question chitra yes yes i would prefer to use a symphony lens if they have large angle alpha because there's got a larger yes. central zone yes. and that works Pretty well for these patients. Yes, yes. you could even much about the angle alpha. If there are the angle alpha is a little larger on the eye trace, yes. then yes. I'm going for a symphony lens. Yes, makes sense. what is your cutoff, sir, for the angle alpha? Maybe hmm. around eight. Or yeah, eight. and in really? these modern eyes with a larger optic zone, you could easily go up to minus 0. 0.7. Not minus, I mean 0. 0.7. 0. 0.7. Yes. Yeah, you could go in for that. You can, now, go that. You can do that. But so all other uh, what is your experience do. with uh, the ringless uh, lenses like the Lucidus and Minivel. Yes, yes. I have got a lot of I think of uh, I have used a lot of them and they're really good, especially in such cases. 
I thought that they give better results. So the only problem is the near vision is not all that good in these patients. So they have an add of almost plus three. So I know, but uh, they they are, are, uh, that's what we have found in a short experience. But how about the multifocals? The main problem the multifocals is the photic phenomenon and the loss of contrast. But the newer multifocals are uh, able to overcome all these challenges. So uh, becoming better and better, I think I'm sure. Uh, of course, all the other contraindications you have beautifully told. Uh, Dr. Jagdish, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, why do you feel... Are you there, Dr. Jagdish? Yes, Dr. Chitra. Why do you feel that today we feel more comfortable using an Indian multifocal as against what it used to be some years back? What is your logic for that? I don't have much experience, Dr. Chitra. <laughs> Hari Priya? Yeah. Dr. Okay, Haripriya, you have yeah. anything to add? Yes. Yeah, so we do use the multifocal, but I think today with the trifocal is one other uh, added advantage. So I think uh, we don't have, I don't know if we have good trifocals in the Indian manufacturing platform. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We do, we do, we do. We do. I sort of feel, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but I feel that the Indian multifocals are better because of better IOL calculations which we have nowadays. The better kind of exclusion criteria which we do now, yeah. those were the major challenges. Now that we have started excluding all that and, and we get bang on target emetropia. This little residual refractive error is what is most disturbing for a multifocal IOL than the angle alpha and kappa, which is so overly discussed. So I think that is one of the reasons maybe with that besides the IOL designs. So, you know, that is my thought. And one last question. How many of you here would think of implanting a multifocal in a high myope or a high probe or in a, in a post LASIK eye? I, I, myope, my, my lenses first. Yeah. And post LASIK eye also because I'm very confident of nowadays yes. the hitting the hitting the bullseye. Yes. So yes. I, I will definitely do it. Myope, I will I will put a plus four ad because these patients are all high myope. They are very used to very good vision. So I would you prefer a multifocal with a plus four ad or a plus three point two five ad. So that gives them a better near vision because they are all used to very good near vision throughout their life. Yes. So high myopes, high probes. Yes. You do whatever you want, they'll fall at your feet. Yeah, very good. That's what an excellent discussion. I'm so glad. Uh, we shall have to go on to glaucoma, but please stay on. There's a lot of cataract in this these talks. Our first speaker is a very dynamic speaker, Dr. Sushmita Kaushik from PGI Chandigarh, who is going to tell us definitive medical management outline, planning the upscaling of the treatment strategy. Six minutes is what you have. You have to be hit the bullseye. Looking forward to Sushmita's talk. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is the slide visible now? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'll just make it full screen. Yeah, is that clear enough? Yes. Right. So right at the outset, thank you, Dr. Chitra, and thank you, AIOS. Great to be here. So this is just upscaling treatment strategy. So I'll try to finish in six minutes on the dot. So the fundamental goal of treatment is to slow the rate of cell loss to an age-dependent rate. And this is something that we must understand that as we go down the line and down the life of a glaucoma patient, we've lost a lot of battle. So that's one reason to catch them and treat them early to get it back. In spite of it being a multifactorial disease, lowering intraocular pressure helps all types of patients. So whether you're high tension, normal tension, or ocular hypertension, all our landmark trials tell us that we need to lower the pressure. And how much we need to lower depends upon what the initial pressure is, the stage of disease, the life expectancy, the rate of damage, and the corneal thickness. But at the end of the day, we need to maintain functional vision throughout the patient's lifetime. That's what we need to understand rather than get it down to this or that number. And we also need to think about the patient's quality of life. So more than 50 years ago, Paul Chandler said it best. Eyes with advanced glaucoma require a pressure below the average. Eyes with limited cupping confined to one pole appear to withstand pressure better. And eyes with a normal disc, which is ocular hypertension, appear to withstand pressure well over many, many years. So at the end of the day, we are not treating the patient, we are treating um, the pressure, we are treating the patient. We usually start with a prostaglandin analog because they have maximum intraocular pressure lowering as monotherapy. They have effective diurnal pressure control. There's minimal tachyphylaxis. It's convenient to dose. And there are few systemic safety concerns. So we've got beyond 
what we should start with. Now, the initial monotherapy, we look for at least 20% reduction in IOP. And if they're responsive, there are two things. Either there's not, the treatment goal is not reached or they're unresponsive. Now, if the treatment goal is not reached, we have either a fixed combination or an un unfixed combination. And this is where the story starts. But periodically, we need to verify the pressures, the fields, the optic disc, as well as the quality of life as we go along. Why would we like monotherapy? Of course, there's better compliance, 49% with one medication compared to 32% without. And, sorry. And why monotherapy again? The washout effect is eliminated. So if you have a 30 second interval between 45% is washed out. So if you give them two drops and they don't have too much time, within 30 seconds, half of one drug will be out. With a two minute interval, about 15%. And with a five minute interval, maybe not. But then it's a very rare patient who would agree to your five minute between. But what is the problem there? The problem is that prostaglandin analogs don't always lower the pressure as much as you would like. And nearly one quarter required additional drug within one year of starting treatment. So that's the problem. You need to give six weeks time to all PGAs and expect a 30% reduction from baseline. But then if it's less than 20% for a PGA, we need to switch to within the class. So that's the first upscaling. If a PGA does not reduce pressure to at least 20 to 25% from baseline, switch within the class before adding. Now, if you've done that and it's at least 20% reduction and yet it's not what you want it to be, then the treatment goal is not reached and then you need to add whether it's fixed or whether it's unfixed. Once you've decided that the second is needed, the factors to keep in mind is efficacy. You need adequate additional lowering, at least 15% additional. So you need 15% over and above what you had with your 20%. And the complementary mechanism of action to a prostaglandin analog makes sense. You need to look at safety and tolerability with minimal systemic adverse effects and the convenience of dosing as well. So the choices we have are beta blockers, alpha-2 agonists, topical CAIs, biotics, and combinations. So combinations, most are with timolol, whether it's dorsolamide or brinzolamide. And dorsolamide with brinzolamide are the efficacy is equivalent to separate bottles, but the advantage is no timolol, which is advantage is maybe some patients like normal tension glaucoma. There are new kids on the block, the rokinase inhibitors, ripasudil and netasudil. We are still evaluating how they work, but initial re reports seem to suggest that netasudil is, works a little better and is a little better tolerated. So the advantages of fixed, commonsensically, dosing is one drop versus two. Convenience will always help patient compliance. There's no risk of washout from the second drug, and there's possible cost savings. It's not that there aren't challenges. So the concept of persistency impacting factors, this, this I found a very, very interesting draft. So it says that if it's ideal, then it would be 100% compliant and there's nothing else. But then we are humans, we're not robots. So after human complacency or denial, it drops to about 80%. With complicated dosing, it would drop further. With added side effects, it drops to about 50%. And if you have economic issues, it drops to about 40%. So it's not just enough to know that a drug is working or the reduction is enough. All of these are human factors and other factors that we need to think about before we start with or insist upon medication. So coming to the side effects, you can have side effects of preservatives. These are all preservative side effects, typically follicular conjunctivitis. And the most common cause is benzalkonium chloride. But then you can have side effects of the anti-glaucoma drug itself. So this is fibromonidine, the periocular pigmentation and the dryness. And this is, of course, Lumigan or Bimatoprast, which we've all seen. You can have these really long lashes, so we avoid it in case we need to give it in one eye. So rule of the thumb now is about two bottles and not more than that. Medications, laser and incisional surgeries, remember, are all effective in lowering intraocular pressure. PGAs consistently are superior in IOP lowering as well as adverse effects, and patients treated medically or surgically are less likely to experience progression of vision. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Yes, you covered it all. So I'm stuck about asking questions. 
But if you have a long-term drift with a kimolol malleate or a prostaglandin, what would you do? So if they've used it for a long time and it doesn't seem to work as much, first for prostaglandins, we would switch within class. Yes. And uh, with timolol, we would have to switch the drug because we don't have any uh, within class as well. But it happens very commonly. We've seen it happen with all three classes. So I can't say which one has more of a long-term drift than the other. So you said that beyond two drug combinations, you won't go to the third. So then when would you use your ROC inhibitors? I thought it's a third line management. See, um, the usual thing what we've seen is that if the patient has to use more than two bottles, and two bottles means at least twice or thrice a day, which makes it about five to six drops a day, that's almost next to impossible. So two bottles would include, include a rock inhibitor, but if I've gone beyond two bottles, I'm already telling the patient that, look, we might as well think of surgery. Nowadays, we have options of laser trabeculoplasty, we have options of ab internal surgeries, they work well, the GAT works well, if not completely, at least in bringing down the requirement of medication. And if we are planning cataract surgery, many times now we combine it with maybe a GAT or a, a gonioscopy assisted transliminal trabeculectomy or maybe a trabectome since we have it now. And we are very happy with our cataract surgery patients. We brought down medication. But usually people don't tolerate more than two bottles with or without the, the net acid. Dr. Satya, do you have any thought? You have to share your screen though. Yeah. On what Dr. Uh, Sushmita said, anything different? Yeah, it's very true. We, we all give the medications, but unfortunately we don't really understand how much of difficulty the patient goes through. Give three bottles, four bottles, it's just not uh, possible. Even if they are old age, even though they are sitting at home, it's just giving, you may feel comfortable, the IOP has come down, but what we have to think about is the quality of life and how much he has to spend for uh, each of his medication. That's not easy, actually. Okay, I think they've started your time unnecessarily. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Satyan, who is uh, Partha Sati, who is the chairman of the Satyan Eye Care Center at Coimbatore. And he's going to deal on something very important, primary angle closure disease, the preferred practice patterns. Uh, thank you so much. I'm just going to use the American Academy of Ophthalmology preferred practice pattern. I'm not added anything or deleted anything from that. So it is easy for you to just go with this. So understanding uh, primary angle closure disease is essential for uh, our routine clinical practice. Uh, the, uh, the disease has uh, multiple presentations. So it has to be classified like a primary angle closure suspect, primary angle closure, primary angle closure glaucoma, acute angle closure crisis, then plateau iris configuration and syndrome. Just to understand these three main uh, uh, clinical uh, path. So primary angle closure uh, or uh, whatever, the angle closure or suspect or angle closure glaucoma, all the three has the iridotrabecular trabecular contact that is more than 180 degrees. And if you just look at the intraocular pressure levels, the PACS will be normal and all the other two will have a higher intraocular pressure levels. If you look at the optic nerve damage, only the angle closure glaucoma will have an uh, optic nerve damage. Other two will not have a uh, optic nerve damage. So that's critical. Understanding on the acute angle closure uh, crisis, we all know that the patient is very symptomatic with the high intraocular pressures. With all the other ocular signs, we can uh, elicit in the slip plan. Uh, coming to the plateau iris configuration, it is nothing but a narrow angles due to the anteriorly positioned uh, ciliary body with a deep uh, central anterior chamber. That's very important to understand. Same with the uh, iris syndrome, plateau iris syndrome, but only thing is the iridal trabecular contact is present even after the peripheral iridotomy and also the IOP is uh, high in the plateau iris syndrome. We have to understand that when we are managing the patient, the care process, especially when we consider the patient, then it goes in the three uh, different ways. One is the preservation of the visual function, maintenance of the quality of life, and we are looking at how we can reduce the risk of uh, acute angle closure uh, crisis. So management of uh, primary angle closure uh, suspect is, we all think that doing, uh, we, we, we all want to do the RPA for every given patient, but it is not uh, justified. The risk of developing to primary angle closure is only 4% and much lesser uh, in case of a primary angle closure glaucoma. So where do you really consider the RPA in these patients is 
when there is a real need for a frequent dilatation, then there is a poor access to the healthcare and follow up symptoms suggesting that there is a prior intermittent acute angle closure crisis. Then some of the patients may require a system medications that may provoke the pupillary block. These are the cases where you want to do the uh, RPI. And if you have not done, what you need to do is you have to inform the patient about the possibility of angle closure crisis. So check on their medications, which can potentially cause the pupillary dilatation and explain them about what is the, where they have to go immediately for their uh, acute angle closure crisis. Coming to the angle closure and angle closure glaucoma, all patients require a PI, but there is a controversial role of a PI in patients with extensive peripheral anterior sinica formation. It is understandable. Uh, just we have to treat these patients as like a primary opening glaucoma prepared practice pattern once you have done the peripheral iodotomy. Doing the peripheral iodotomy, it's always better to uh, put the patient on the sympathomimetics, parasympathomimetics, that is the pilocarpin, yes, and uh, constrict the pupil very well so that it, it is uh, stretched and you can easily do the peripheral iodotomy. So identifying the uh, patent PA is uh, critical. So you have to see the air bubbles and you can see the gush of aqueous and also the pigment release. This is the end point. And you have to make sure that at least 100 microns that uh, adequate size is there. And we have to make sure again, there is a how much of the peripheral anterior sinica is present in the guardianship, whether you do it immediately or a little later on the follow-up also you can do. But IOP measurements needs to be checked at the end of half an hour to two hours to make sure that there's no acute spikes in intraocular pressures. Post-laser medication, you have to give the prednisolone acetate. Uh, some people give five days, some people give uh, 10 days in a tapering dosage, but each one can desire on their own uh, way. Uh, looking at the RPA, uh, again, the follow-up, you can do it in days or weeks, but you have to make sure that the uh, visualization of the zonules and anterior lens capsule or the ciliary process to make sure that you have done a proper PI opening is good and you have to measure the intraocular pressures. If the PI is, uh, sorry, if the persistent uh, IOP is there, high IOP is there, you have to understand there is a trabecular damage or occluded PI or there is a other mechanisms are involved. Our patient may have even a primary open angle glaucoma also. Looking at the acute angle closure crisis, you have to give all the topical anti glaucoma medications, topical, oral, or intravenous. Make sure that you break the pupillary block mechanism, either by corneal indentation or by using the muscle hook. Uh, sometimes you, may, you have to go for a, sometimes you have to go for a surgical PI, but if you are still uh, not comfortable in doing the surgical PA, you can use the hyperosmotics or paracentesis to make the hernia clear, clear and then you can do the PA. Later on, you can do the either a trabeclectomy or just a lens extraction you can plan. Fellow eye, you have to make sure that you do the yard peripheral iodotomy because within a five years period, the patients may go in for a acute angle closure crisis in the other eye. PACD and uh, acute angle closure glaucoma, the Eagle study and other study has shown that the uh, clear lens extraction may have a role to play, but I'm not going to discuss that in detail here. The plateau iris syndrome and the configuration, your peripheral iodotomy may not be uh, very useful. There is no evidence to suggest that. So you have to understand that. But if you have the higher AOP, you just go with the primary open angle glaucoma uh, preferred practice pattern treatment. So other factors to consider, counsel and refer at the correct timings. And we have to make sure that socioeconomic considerations and the quality of life is in our mind all the time. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. Thank, Thank you very much. While Dr. Uh, Harsh Kumar is sharing his screen, I have a question for you. In the angle closure disease, the con IOP control is not so optimal and you decide, you feel you have to do a trap at this point of time. Would you consider taking the cataract uh, out at this, even if it is a clear lens or an early cataract, would you consider that keeping in mind that the challenges post when you have to do a cataract surgery later. What are your thoughts? Dr. Satyan? So having said the clear lens extension, I think we have one more session on Sunday, but the Eagle study has shown that there is a significant reduction in the number of medications. Uh, you say so not I'm the not medication. meaning that. You yeah. are going to do a trap. Would yeah. you like to, in an arrow angle uh, eye, would you like to combine it with the lens extraction keeping in mind that later the AC is shallow and the cataract surgery is going to be more challenging in these eyes? Uh, that depends upon the intraocular pressure levels also. If the high intraocular pressure levels, then I won't go for lens extraction at the same time because there is going to be a huge risk of uh, 
for adults, hemorrhagic for adults. So even doing a trap immediately is not going to be a good uh, advice, but you have to just wait for some time. And then you plan uh, whether you want to do only cataract or trap, you can plan it a little later. There could have been more questions, but I think paucity of time, we have to move on to Dr. Harsh Kumar. He again is a very leading uh, glaucomatologist uh, from and at CFS, heading the CFS uh, glaucoma department. And he's going to tell us something very relevant, avoiding bleb fibrosis, every Thank small you. step. Thank you, Chitra, for having me here. And uh, definitely, I think this is the most important part because in the end, when the drugs fail, we have to do the surgery. In the surgery, if we do more fibrosis, we are in trouble. If we do less fibrosis, we are in trouble. So it has all to be very well balanced. We know the trouble is that coagulation, inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling is bound to happen, but in a regular fashion. We know that the risk factors primarily are that if there's any kind of surgery that has previously been done on that eye, or there's any kind of a secondary glaucoma like neovascular glaucoma, if there's any inflammation like uveitis, or even our drops being used, there's going to be higher risk. So what exactly are we going to do? Preoperatively, we have to be very careful in the long term we have to try and use preservative-free medications, at least BAK-free if we can't use preservative-free. And then when we are nearer the surgery and we find that there's a lot of inflammation, we can use topical steroids, topical NSAIDs. You must treat the inflammatory disease of the eye. And you have to stop the anticoagulants, but in consultation with the person who started it. Again, uh, we have shifted on doing the uh, what we used to do over here, the virgil suture, we now, everybody has gone on to bring a corneal traction suture because the virgil suture used to bleed and there was a lot of fibrosis because of that itself. Again, what flap are we going to use? Yes, we were all taught with the limbus based flap, but we have now mostly shifted to the fornix based flap because all the complication, including leakage, blebitis, and dorsalmitis is much more uh, in the <coughs> other ones. So the uh, fornix based flap can give you a easier surgery and lesser fibrosis post-operative. Again, any kind of bleeding, you have to really be active to stop it. And the pressure would be first, be very careful, don't do excess uh, cautery at the edges because that is going to be creating a trouble. But whenever there's a bleed, the first thing is to put pressure, put some <coughs> adrenaline over there, do some cautery over there. You can even put some visco, which really helps as we have seen a lot of time. How should the filtration area be positioned? Be very careful. Any interpatriable area, or if you are going into the inferior areas, could be a disaster because the inflammation and the endothelmitis could be much, much higher. Again, how do we make a scleral flap really decides how lesser fibrosis we can have. We have to have a larger flap and the edges of the flap should not reach the end of the thing because what we basically want is that the flow should not be anterior. And therefore, what we have found out is that you have to have a larger dissected area of the conjunctiva. And the mito should be applied more diffusely. You have to have posterior flow because you have stopped short with your scleral flap more anteriorly. And then obviously, you have to have adjustable sutures so that you can release them whenever you want. Anti-metabolites are a critical part and obviously mitomycin C and 5, if you have been there with us for a long time, primarily it is mitomycin C that we are using now. <clears throat> and uh, obviously it gives us a better chance. Uh, we can do suture lysis and uh, suture removal at a later date also. And hypotony, but hypotony and Excessive filtration are always dangers that we must look for. We all know how to use it. What people have done is now, instead of moving from a higher concentration, they are applying lesser concentration, more diffusely. And depending upon what kind of glaucoma you have and what is the challenge of fibrosis, if larger the chances of fibrosis, you can actually put it for longer time, varying from anywhere from 90 seconds to almost four minutes but people have gone on to lesser timings and lesser concentrations. You can always use 5-FU operatively or post-operatively. And obviously, one can also use anti-VEGF as we reported in ophthalmology. The idea of this was, though, though it is expensive, you can put 0.05 ml over there. Whenever the moment you finish your surgery, 
the great advantage is that it prevents fibroblast migration, it prevents wound healing, it prevents vascularization. And in cases where mito cannot be used, especially in high myo, this drugs works wonders. Obviously, ologen has been tried extensively, but it takes a lot of learning curve. People are also using amniotic membrane. Uh, you can use post-operatively, you can use mitomycin C drops in a 10 cc vial of TSHU2, add two, two milligram of the vial, and you can use it two to three times a day. People use mitomycin C swabs for two to four minutes, uh, it can be 0.02 or 0 0.04. And you can do early sutureolysis or you can do a uh, uh, removal if you have a releasable suture and the moment you press the bleb is well formed you can do needling if the bleb is failing and you can use mitomycin or 5-FQ after you have done the need and there are newer methods like radiation and genetic manipulation which are still in the realm of trial and the most important thing I feel is that you have to prevent uh, you have to use pre-operative steroids or NSAID you have to tailor your surgery use post-operative antifibrotics or needling if required, and the most important thing that you must bring. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Arshul. You covered it all. Just one simple question. How soon or how late would you remove a releasable suture? And very, very rarely, if a person has gone and done a, a trap without a mitovacin, how soon would you remove the releasable in that? Uh, if, you have, if you have put mitomycin, you can actually wait for three weeks, but it all depends if the fibrosis is fast, you're doing a massage, but it's not uh, succeeding very well, then you should immediately remove the suture. So it could be as early as one week, it could be as late as four to five weeks. Dr. Shishmita, you think different? Yeah, the intraocular pressure would define it, and uh, but I would be very wary of removing it before one week. Because then you could land up just a massage would probably suffice. But as Dr. Har said, one, two, three to four weeks anytime. Thank you very much. Dr. Satyajit, you may be on the same line of thought, right? Dr. Satyajit, you're muted. Okay, could you... Uh, Request uh, Dr. Dr. Manish, go with the next speaker. Yes, our next speaker is Dr. Manish Singh from BBI Foundation, Calcutta who's going to be telling us something very strategic, how to align our visual fields to our treatment pattern, preferred practice guidelines. On to you, doctor. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, madam, and thank you, AS, for this opportunity. So in the next six minutes, I'll be basically highlighting the role of visual field in uh, glaucoma treatment plan. And as the topic is, I'll be uh, sharing uh, data from the EGS and the APGS guideline, mainly the EGS guideline because it's one of the most recent guidelines we have. We have often seen that patients with glaucoma are treated with OCT alone and EGS has very nicely mentioned that every patient with glaucoma should have a visual field test done because OCT of the disc or RMFL alone is not enough for diagnosing a glaucoma patient. So every patient is very strongly recommended to have a visual field for every glaucoma patient. Regarding uh, programs which should be used for these patients in Humphrey, you can use a CETA standard, CETA fast or CETA faster. Goldman size 3 stimulus should be used with either a central 24-2 or 30-2. One point it has been highlighted that you should use the same strategy and the test pattern every time because then you can compare and see the rate of progression using different machines or different strategy won't give, won't uh, suffice the purpose. Of late, there's been a lot of discussion about using 10 dash 2 fields in patients where the visual field like 24 dash 2 or 30 dash 2 is normal, but the disc is extremely suspicious and 10 dash 2 can be used to see the central field. What EGS has highlighted that in case you want to use a 10 dash 2 in these cases, 10 dash 2 field should be an addition to 24 dash 2. We should not replace a 24 dash 2 or a 30 dash 2 with a 10 dash 2 fields. Coming to staging, visual fields are extremely useful. There are multiple staging systems available, but they have recommended the most easy staging system based on MD alone, and which is acceptable for most clinicians, classifying patient to early and moderate and advanced glaucoma based on the MD. We also should know that worse the MD, higher is the risk of progression of glaucoma and higher is the risk of blindness. Based on the visual field, you can classify glaucoma and can also determine the target intraocular pressure. For example, early glaucoma aim for 20% reduction, moderate glaucoma 30% reduction, and in advanced glaucoma, try to have an intraocular pressure in the early teens. 
We all know the target IP is calculated based on multiple factors. Two important factors like the glaucoma damage and the rate of progression are determined using the visual field. Coming to rate of progression, it can be seen with OCT and visual field both, but fields still are the best tool for seeing the rate of progression. OCT analysis for progression cannot replace visual field at this moment because OCT progression again is not age corrected. So how many fields we should do to see the rate of progression? Any newly diagnosed glaucoma patient, you should do a visual field three times per year for four, two years. That is, you should do six fields in two years to get an idea about the rate of progression is slow or fast. If the rate of progression is slow, you can reduce the number of fields. Also, if it's early disease, you can reduce the number of fields. Also, it is important to classify slow and fast progression because accordingly, you need to reassess your target pressure and change your treatment. The various ways to detect rate of progression, we all know about the event and the trend analysis. The recent GPA software has both the event and trend analysis. For example, we have the VFI plot or the MD plot, which shows the changes of the field over time to determine the rate of progression. Plus event analysis, you can have point-to-point -point comparison with the baseline field to understand whether it is in the likely or a possible progression. This I have taken from the APGS guideline. They have highlighted that whenever you're seeing progression before stamping at progression, try to exclude these factors. For example, whether there's any learning curve or any performance issue, whether the patient has developed any new cataract or there is change in the pupillary size in previous or new examination, or maybe the patient has developed some new retinal disease or a CNS disease, or maybe overall the patient is not feeling well, the general health is not issue, and the patient is not able to perform the field on that particular day. So as I was telling about the rate of progression, I give you two examples, like there's a slope D and slope E. The D slope are the patient where the rate of progression is acceptable. They are not going to have any severe visual field loss in next, in the lifetime. Although if you see the rate uh, of progression in E, it's very, very rapid rate of progression. These patients, you need to be aggressive with your management and you can even consider going for surgery. This is the last slide about a short wave uh, Automated perimetry, both APGS and EGS has highlighted that in current glaucoma practice, there is no need for doing a swap. There's no role of swap in glaucoma. Recording management. in progress. So to conclude, visual field definitely have a central loan in glaucoma management because the quality of life depends on the field loss. And it is useful for diagnosis, for your staging, for planning your target intraocular pressure to assess whether the patient is progressing or not, and also to understand the overall success of your treatment plan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Dr. Sunita Dobe to, to connect the slides. A very good talk, but I think I'll keep the questions only if we have enough time before the next session. The challenge here is the next session is going to get cut, cut by 20 minutes. So that's the hurry now. So on to you, Dr. Sunita. Uh, okay, so I would like to thank Dr. Chitra for having me here. I am going to talk on normal tension glaucoma, preferred practices. So, and NTG and POAG represent a continuum of open angle glaucomas. And while intraocular pressure is a predominant risk factor for POAG, IOP independent risk factors are also said to have a role in NTG. And it is supported by the collaborative normal tension glaucoma study, which showed favorable effect of IOP reduction on progression of visual field. However, progression is seen in some patients despite lowering of IOP, suggesting non-IOP factors as well. So how common it is? In a population-based study, mean proportion of NTG was higher in Asian population, 76% as compared to white population. And it is the most common form of glaucoma seen in East Asian countries. In Japan, 92% of the POAG patients had IOP of 21 millimeter mercury or less. There are subtle differences in clinical characteristics uh, of NTG from PUAG, and the, the defects are more focal, uh, close to uh, macula, focal RNFL defects, and visual field loss um, are dense, cotomas, and again, which are close to fixation, and there is increased prevalence of disc hemorrhage in normal tension glaucomas. Coming to risk factors, uh, we all know about the non-vascular risk factors. IOP is the risk factor uh, with wider IOP fluctuations uh, along with female sex, myopia, and thin CCT. And Plammer has come out uh, with a syndrome, primary vascular dysfunction, and which is commonly seen in patients with normal tension glaucoma. 
Apart from that, um, diseases like diabetes, systemic hypertension, hypotension, migraine, and sleep apnea are associated with normal tension glaucoma. So basically, uh, vasospasm and endothelial dysfunction are the common pathology uh, which leads to autonomic dysregulation in most of these diseases and uh, leading to decreased ocular perfusion pressure uh, and uh, less blood supply to the optic nerve. So it is multifactorial uh, and several factors are responsible uh, for the damage of the disc, including nocturnal hypertension, autonomic dysfunction, variability of the intraocular pressure and obstructive sleep apnea. Now, how do you diagnose normal tension glaucoma? A detailed history, including targeted questions towards systemic conditions, because it can be associated with systemic diseases, including hemato hematological crisis in the past or injury should be considered. History should be taken regarding migraine, Raynaud's, episodes of shock, headache, sleep apnea, and other neurological symptoms. I think it's very important that you ask a lot of questions during um, before examination about the systemic history. Use of medications, including systemic and inhalational steroids, because steroids may have caused damage before and after withdrawal of steroid, the IOP may have become normal. And use of antihypertensive agents like beta blockers should also be taken into account, which causes reduction of the intraocular pressure. Um, again, it, since it's a diagnosis of exclusion, one has to rule out uh, POAG by doing 24 hours diurnal variation of pressure and measuring central corneal thickness. Um, um, one has to rule out primary open, open, uh, angle closure glaucoma. So gonioscopy is a must and subtle signs of pseudo exfoliation and pigmentary glaucoma, especially pigmentary glaucoma in burnt out phase when the IOP has become normal, but there are still disc and field changes. And also the pupillary evaluation to elicit a front pupillary defect in asymmetric disease. It's important to rule out um, congenital disc anomalies and systemic conditions, which can mimic uh, the glaucomatous uh, uh, you know, changes. Uh, so these are the conditions of congenital disc anomalies, morning glory syndrome, optic disc fit, tilted optic disc or optic disc hyperplasia. And these are the systemic conditions which can mimic uh, glaucomatous uh, disc and field changes. Now coming to investigations, it's very important to measure 24 hours um, blood pressure to exclude nocturnal systemic hypertension and uh, blood investigations to do a lot systemic etiology, including uh, CBC, SR, CRP, uh, ANA lipid profile, etc. Uh, MRI is not indicated in all patients, but it is indicated uh, in young patients to rule out intracranial space occupying lesions um, and uh, if the fields are suggestive of neurological defects and if there is rim pallor, which is more than cupping. Pallor doppling and Doppler imaging of common carotid artery if you're suspecting um, the obstruction in the carotid artery or its branches. And if a patient is giving history of sleep apnea, then polysomnography should be performed. Genetic uh, testing should be performed in uh, optic neuropathies. Now coming to management, uh, since IOP is the major risk factor in causation of normal tension glaucoma also, uh, IOP reduction should be achieved, at least 30% IOP reduction should be as achieved as suggested by the collaborative normal tension glaucoma study. And again, PG analogs are the first choice of drug uh, in normal tension glaucoma also. Uh, one can use brimonidine and dorsolamide, um, which are supposed to be neuroprotective and vasoprotective. Um, and SLT uh, can be performed and surgery is the uh, surgery uh, can be done if uh, the medical management is not effective and uh, the role of, of uh, improvement of ocular blood flow is controversial and um, uh, it's not practiced routinely however it's important to identify and treat any cardiovascular or hematological disorder rule out nocturnal hypotension so to conclude controlling the IOP remains the in the management of normal tension glaucoma also. However, consideration must be given to the vascular factors more so in progressive cases and a detailed systemic history and evaluation is a must in these patients. Neuroprotective agents theoretically improve the function uh, of optic nerve and this interesting area of investigation.
implications for the treatment for future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sunita, for covering a lot of it in the six minutes. I, if Dr. Sunita Dube is there, I'm sorry, Dr. Shushmita Kaushik is there? Yes. Yes, I just want one question. <laughs> what is the role of management of hypertension in the treatment of NTG? Treatment of hypertension. Well, um, we would want to protect the optic nerve head perfusion. So I suppose we should be telling, first thing is no antihypertensives at night. So we would uh, write to our internist and avoid beta blockers if possible, because that's what lowers. So calcium channel blockers are supposed to be protected to neural tissue, and that would that would be one note which I think. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Sushmita. And Dr. Chitra also, I'll quickly, with your permission, I uh, would like to thank each and every speaker, moderator, expert, and panelists for being the part of the last session. Uh, Dr. Chitra, uh, you are the moderator for the next session as well. So I would quickly like to request you to conclude the previous session within 30 seconds so we can proceed toward our next session. Yes. Thank you very much, expert panel. Thank you very much, speakers, for doing justice to that short time which I gave. I think it gave us a grand view of what how we should go back and treat our patients thanks a lot i'll keep coming back to you for sure for my arc webinars thank you very much thank you. bye bye bye, bye. Thank, thank you dr harsh thank you everybody thank you so much thank, thank you, you dr Kattian. thank you thank bye. you